So good, good morning. I'm, I'm Larry Irving, and I'm very worried for my friend Tim Lorton. If I'm the smartest person he knows, he's got to get out more um, on any subject. Maybe the wizards, and uh, nobody wants to know much about them. Um, I'm going to give my colleagues a minute to get settled and give folks who maybe need to take a bathroom break or otherwise go out for a second, get up and, and do what they need to do, and then we'll uh, get started. Um, while we're getting started, let me just, we're not going to do bios for the folks who are speaking today. We're just going to kind of um, let you read their bios online. But let me introduce who's here in addition to me. It's Richard Bennett, Senior Research Fellow for the um, ITIF. Um, Michael Calabresi, the um, Senior Research Fellow, Open Technology Initiative. Jeff Campbell, Senior Director for the Americas, Global Government Affairs for Cisco. And Richard Engelman, Director of Spectrum Resources at Sprint. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's apt that we're entitled Collision Course. Um, when you look at what's happening with Spectrum in, in our country, it's pretty clear that we're in a on a Collision Course. I, I kind of keep looking at where we are. I've been involved in Spectrum for about 25 years now, and it's amazing that we haven't made more progress. So for the next hour or so, we're going to discuss the surge of music, movies, games, of wired and wireless devices. And we'll review what our current wired and wireless infrastructure and policies affecting that infrastructure will accommodate this entertainment convergence. The panel is going to take a review of the challenges and controversies surrounding consumer expectations, business needs and models, and the need for all of us for more speed. Um, Tim has asked me and, he's asked, and I've asked my colleagues to stay away from jargon and acronyms. We're going to try to keep this as conversation as possible. Now, if you know Spectrum Policy, you know it's almost impossible to avoid jargon, but we promise to do our very best. Uh, I love technology and I love media. Um, I usually have at least two mobile, sometimes three or four mobile devices with me at any given time. And I have to confess that when it comes to technology, I am the 1%. Um, I am, for the one of the few times in my life, I will proudly admit being one of the 1%. I'm using my iPad to watch movies over Netflix as recently as last night, this morning. I was watching ESPN highlights on Slingbox on my, uh, one of my mobile devices. Uh, for those of you who are my Facebook friends, you know I post a lot and often, um, and those posts can be fairly data intensive. And for the purposes of bandwidth, um, I don't think it's going to change. As I watch how people younger than me use technology, they're even bigger consumers. But one of the problems is our systems don't, just can't stand it. I'm, when you look at how people use technology, we're overloading our systems. Whether you're talking wired or wireless, I'm not sure we have the system we need for the future. I was in a bowl game. Um, I mean, I must regret it was a horrible bowl game, but Stanford lost because I kick a good kick a 30 yard, 5 yard field goal, so it's a long trip back home. But I would at a bowl game in Arizona, put 70,000 people in the stands, and all 70,000 had some kind of a mobile device. And for the three hours we were in that stadium, we weren't using those mobile devices. Everybody was at a standstill. The guys in front of you, behind me, whether you were a, a fan of Oklahoma State or you were a fan of Stanford, you had a device you could use because the spectrum capacity just wasn't there for that. And the question I asked, is that going to be the norm? When you start looking at the numbers of how we're using it, uh, somebody told me that we've doubled our use of, of bandwidth across this nation every year for the last five years. Now, I'm not really good at numbers, but when you get 2 to 4 to um, 16, to 16 times 16, that's a pretty big number. And those are the kinds of numbers we're talking about. When you look at other numbers, and I, I know Jeff will drill down on this uh, at some length, um, right now, 10% of internet traffic, or I guess it was in 2010, 10% of internet traffic was um, video. By the end of 2013, 90% of internet traffic will be video, and 66% of mobile traffic will be video. That's a significant difference from where we are. And, and that's, you know, we haven't gotten it right yet. I mean, whether you talk about YouTube or Facebook or iPad or, or, or tablets, we've never really been right about what the next big technology is going to be. And each next technology is a bigger bandwidth user than the previous next technology. And we haven't talked about gaming. And gaming is, what, believe it or not, the biggest user of data, from what I've been hearing, of any of these um, sources. What I'm going to ask the, um, the panel to talk about is, what's the impact of consumers of, our, of, of all of these issues? We're going to talk a little about spectrum caps and throttling. We're going to talk about whether or not we have the right policy mix to promote investment on in infrastructure. And we're going to do all of that in the next hour. I'm going to ask each of my colleagues to uh, provide us with two to three minutes of opening remarks. And then we're going to turn to you um, for an open discussion. And we really would like an open discussion, so please get your questions ready as they're speaking. I will keep them to two or three minutes, and I will keep them on, on focus. You please keep me on focus. Um, our first presenter, Jeff Campbell. Thanks, Larry. And now that you're admitting to be part of the 1%, uh, one percent, for one uh, purpose only, <laughs> we're, we're going to have to make sure that Occupy Larry Irving doesn't start uh, during this panel. 
Um, so uh, to open the discussion, I thought I would share some data that, and, and some projections on internet traffic that we do at Cisco. Uh, Cisco has the uh, 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 interesting position of having almost every carrier in the world as a customer, and so that gives us the opportunity to analyze a lot of data about internet traffic. Um, and annually, uh, we both look backwards on the data that we have, and we make a five-year projection going forward in something that we call the Visual Networking Index, and it, it, it comes out uh, once a year. Um, and I was just going to take a few snippets of data, particularly focus on U.S. mobile data traffic going forward. So this is just uh, in the United States and just mobile traffic, uh, not fixed traffic. Um, the first is, is that uh, in the last year that we have full measurements for, uh, mobile data traffic in the year 2010 grew by 2.7 times, almost tripled in one year. And during that year, uh, uh, some carriers uh, implemented some, uh, some limited, uh, some pricing schemes uh, that had the effect of uh, charging people more for more amounts of data and whatnot. And we did see that even at the point when those um, pricing plans were implemented, it didn't change the trajectory of overall data usage at all uh, going forward. Our projection for, uh, for U.S. total mobile data traffic uh, is that it will grow from 45 petabytes per month, which it was in 2010, to by 2015, it will be 915 petabytes per month. That is 21 times the data in five years. If you, if you take that out to annual growth rate, it's an average growth rate of 83%. project that by 2015, 5% of all data will be mobile. And the thing to remember, of course, is the amount of data is doubling every year in total. So it shows you that mobility is, is creating an enormous amount of growth here, but that there will be needs for both dramatic increases in capacity in the mobile networks, but also in the fixed networks as well going forward. And with that, I'll, I'll stop here and we'll talk more about what that means later. Thanks, Richard. Okay, well, I'll, I'll talk from a mobile operator's perspective. Um, uh, how do we deal with this growth is, is, is a huge focus within the mobile industry. Um, every day you read articles and hear people talk about the need for more spectrum, and that's certainly part of the issue. But uh, if you look back historically, uh, how quickly can spectrum be brought to the marketplace? It's not very quick. How much isn't being used today that's actually practical to use? There's not a lot of it. And so operators are having to find other ways to increase their, their use of the spectrum that they have. So there's a number of tools that, that Sprint is using and, and the other operators are using. Uh, adding capacity at cell sites, bringing in new channels where there's a need. Not all cell sites are congested or crowded. Not all traffic at all hours of the day is, is the same. It varies on location and time of day and user. So bringing the capacity to there, sometimes it's shifting existing uh, channels that are in use in one place to another place or using channels that hadn't previously been used. It's increasing backhaul. That is the, the pipe that goes to the cell site, making that bigger so that the cell can, can send more. It's also optimizing the, the, the video streams or the other multimedia streams. Um, when you get cable at home and you want to watch TV, you're looking for a high definition signal. But when you're looking for a video on your phone, you don't need a high definition quality signal to look at. You need something that's optimized for your device that looks great on your device, but also is optimized to take less of the capacity on the network. And so operators are looking at that as well. 
we're looking at how we deploy our networks and the technologies we use. So many of the operators are moving from, from second generation technologies to third generation and newer technologies. Each of these generally results in higher data speeds, which Jeff talked about that the consumers wanted, but they also are much more efficient in how they use the spectrum. So you, you've read a lot probably about LTE, the latest technology that people are deploying, wireless carriers are deploying in the US. LTE may be, in some cases, 10 times more efficient in how it uses the spectrum. Um, and that will help address some of the capacity needs. Also building smaller cell sites, building cell sites where the demand is. So in a room like this, it can generate a lot of demand. We all have laptops open. We all probably have Wi-Fi up. So maybe you're relying on Wi-Fi, but it may also be relying on uh, cell operators set up. So having small cells that can deliver the capacity in small areas and putting those in where your hotspots is another uh, way of doing that. So those are some of the thoughts. Spectrum is a wall. Spectrum is something that that will need to be brought to the marketplace, but I don't want to portray the impression that there aren't tools that operators have and are using today to try to address these capacity needs. Perfect. In two minutes, five seconds. Okay, it doesn't get better than that. Uh, Michael? <laughs> uh, thanks, Larry. Um, all right, so, so, you know, we see a collision course on, on both the wireline and wireless side. Um, uh, I'll just say briefly on, on wireline that, um, you know, you have two two troubling trends with, you know, what Craig was talking about, um, you know, a future of less facilities-based competition combined with the trend toward data caps and usage-based pricing. And, uh, you know, the collision course is, is, you know, that creates both an incentive and means to undermine over-the-top uh, video as, as competition uh, on, on these cable and other networks, as well as training consumers to expect to pay premium for the world of pervasive connectivity we're trying to get to. We can talk more about that. Uh, I'd like to say a bit more about wireless, uh, which I think is more troubling, uh, because the, uh, the data caps, the bandwidth caps are, are much lower, and the incremental uh, data uh, costs are much higher. Um, and so, for example, you know, what should be a killer app, something like mobile, uh, mobile video Skyping, um, at a, with a two gigabyte uh, cap, you're not going to see that as readily as you would, say, on a home network with 250 gigabytes. Um, there's also an increasingly disproportionate use of mobile broadband as the primary internet connection, particularly for lower income and minority folks who can't afford two different expensive subscriptions. And it's a mobile 4G LTE is a potential substitute uh, for wired, it should be, especially in rural areas, um, but uh, you know, but may, may not be with these with these sort of caps. Um, and 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 by the way, most of the spectrum is fallow out there. So the remedy um, definitely need competition policy. We're dead without that. So good we didn't have that merger uh, recently that AT and T Mobile. But more important is to make spectrum capacity abundant because auctions alone aren't going to do it. We're running out of, of spectrum to auction. Um, so we need a balanced spectrum policy uh, that promotes spectrum reuse because uh, a small cell strategy reusing the same spectrum over and over is really the, the only way we're gonna, we're gonna beat the, um, the uh, hockey stick in data demand that, that Jeff just outlined. And so, you, and so you do that through direct access to the airwaves in two, two ways. One is more unlicensed because already Wi-Fi is offloading 30% of smartphone and 90% of tablet uh, traffic, and it's substituting for 130,000 cell sites that would cost $65 billion to build that we don't have to. And the other is, is we need shared access to underutilized uh, spectrum, particularly the federal bands. Uh, NTA just identified 950 contiguous megahertz of good spectrum that's barely in use uh, on, a, on a kind of a pure capacity basis uh, that could be open for shared use that doesn't fit carrier business models but would fit a small cell sharing strategy. Thank you. Richard. Uh, yeah, let me, let me start by pushing back on a little bit on something that Jeff said about the, uh, <clears throat> the predictions about the ever-increasing demand for bandwidth. Some of the studies that uh, Akamai and others have done of worldwide data rate uh, trends on the internet uh, show that over the last couple of years, the average data rates actually declined. 
And the reason for that, obviously, is because more people are connecting mobile devices to the internet, and mobile devices don't have the same data rate capability that wireline devices do. And so, to the extent that we kind of repeat these, the analyses that we've made about broadband and, and the shifting of television from shared uh, programming of, that people watch you at broadcast TV, a particular time and place, um, the replacement of that by personalized programming, which is video on demand and it's YouTube and you know that's all video too. Um, <clears throat> I think we sort of miss out on, on the fact that you know there's more going on in the broadband ecosystem than just the transition of television from a shared programming medium to a unicast personalized medium. Um, and you can also be misled if you if you look at the uh, applications by the data uh, capacity that they consume, because video is a high data consumptive application, right? But so if, if you're sort of looking at the overall picture in terms of how many bytes are moving across the networks that are dedicated to video versus the number of bytes that are devoted to, say, text messaging, you get a completely false picture about what it is that people are actually doing. Because, you know, one minute of video consumes a lot more capacity than, than a whole day of text messaging. But, you know, in terms of the time that the individuals are spending on those applications, it's not reflected in the data volume because the application needs are so different. And so there is an argument that says that going forward, <clears throat> the need for more bandwidth is actually moderated by the ability of technology to more efficiently uh, use the bandwidth that's available. And this is not only the case in, in, in spectrum where we can translate more, more better efficiency with the use of spectrum into more bytes per second transmitted, but in the video context, advances in technology allow us to compress video better so an hour of high definition television or what looks like high definition television to the viewer doesn't take as much bandwidth today as it did five years ago because we have technologies like MPEG-4 that permit it to be compressed better. Uh, so there are some moderating influences <clears throat> um, and it's also the case that well, facilities-based competition hasn't produced all the benefits that we'd like at the moment. There's some things behind the scenes that don't really get much attention in terms of the technologies that facilities-based competition has uh, stimulated. The, the technologies that actually make LTV so efficient are, to, to the greatest extent, actually originated in DSL. And so it was the desire of, of telephony engineers to make DSL possible. I mean, remember, those wires that DSL runs over were not put in the ground to do broadband, right? They were put in the ground to do telephony, just like the cable system wasn't put in the ground to do broadband either. It was put in the ground to do, to do television. And so internet access over both of those facilities is, is an accident. It's something that happened, you know, because there was a need for it, engineers came up with the ways to do it, and so those innovations that that allowed that to happen in first in DSL have rippled all the way through to LTE. So Richard, we want to um, look at the panel again. And Jeff, do you want to respond to uh, Richard's comments with regard to, I mean, we've had this bright, cheery, uplifting morning with Fred Moffat making us feel great about the future. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe you can uh, uh, have a little discussion with Richard about whether or not we should be worried or not. Well, uh, you know, I don't want to be too much of a downer here because in general I think that there are a wide variety of things that can and will be done to improve the situation, but, but I don't think we can merely rely on the fact that applications get more efficient, and they do and will continue to do so. In fact, our projections include those efficiencies. We also can't solely rely on the fact that carriers will, will subdivide cells and will move to more efficient transmission technologies and things like that, all of which we also believe will happen. Nonetheless, when you're talking about 21 times more data in five years, it's going to take some spectrum to do this as well. If you look at the, you know, the FCC's analysis of this uh, was that we're going to need 275 megahertz more of spectrum. Even if they're off by a couple of orders of magnitude, <coughs> we're still looking at, at significant amounts of spectrum that are going to need to be made available to, to handle this. And, and I think the, the thing that we might want to also recognize is that part of the advancement in technologies will change the way that people will interact with the technologies. For instance, 
texting requires almost no bandwidth and is, you know, right, is increasingly becoming a rounding error in the network. On the flip side, as we move to a video world, you know, my boss al almost refuses to have any meetings that aren't on video anymore if it can't be avoided because the quality of the meeting on video is so much better than just having an audio uh, voice conference call that you know, he's like, if I'm going to devote the time to this, it, we're going to have a high quality meeting. And so that is going to drive more and more of the tra traffic to video. And that will include personal interactions, because personal video interaction gets better. And as people get used to that, you're going to, you're going to move from text to video over time. And that's what's going to fill up the bandwidth. It's not that texting will go away. It's that we will have richer experiences that's going to use more bandwidth. And I don't think we're going to be able to avoid the need for additional spectrum, even though there are a variety of things that can be done all across the board to get there. And, and frankly, we're behind the curve on getting the spectrum. Uh, um, Michael, do you want to, it looked like you have something to add. Yeah, there. yeah, which, uh, uh, one thing which I, I think is also, I hope, uh, optimistic, which is that we also have to be mindful of the distinction between mobile and nomadic. In other words, they're both untethered, right, in you know, the wires. Uh, but the fact is, I, I think, and Jeff would know the exact, um, right now the mobile, mobile video usage is about what, 80% in building, right? Yeah, so, so even though we're moving to this future, as I said, something like you know, mobile video Skyping ought to be a killer, a killer app that everyone would want to have these face-to-face -face conversations with their boyfriend or girlfriend as they're you know, moving around. But, uh, but the thing is that most of the time, you're with, potentially within reach of a wire, uh, right? And when you are, that's, that's why Wi-Fi is doing so much, of, taking so much of, of the offload burden. AT&T has saved its own bacon on the iPhone, right, with 30,000 Wi-Fi hotspots. They're running a, a, over 100 million uh, Wi-Fi connections for their own customers per month, over a billion a year. So if you're within re reach of a wire, you can, that's what I meant by, before by spectrum reuse and small cell strategy. You don't need to go through that expensive auction spectrum all the way to a tower. You can go through public shared spectrum a short distance to this wire uh, if it's there, if it's open, and hopefully we'll have faster wire connections, fiber and so on, in, you know, in many more homes and places to do this. So that works for some purposes, and, but even when you use a Wi-Fi, there's still some wired connection, there's still some bandwidth that's got to be used to make that happen. So right. when you're looking at, at the way people are using our technology, and you look at our current infrastructure, over the normal course of the next two or three years, um, or say five years, are, are we headed in the right direction? Are we going to be able to, um, will carriers, will the industry be able to accommodate the growth we're seeing, based upon what you're seeing right now? OK? Yeah, I, I'm pro-spectrum. ITIF is pro-spectrum. We want more spectrum available for broadband networks than we, than we currently have. So don't take the previous remarks that I made about the increasing efficiency as an argument that says that we want to keep spectrum allocated to the historical legacy uses that it's allocated to. And we're also in favor of unlicensed. But the, you know, we have to understand that the role that unlicensed has in the wireless ecosystem versus the role that licensed spectrum for mobile broadband networks has. And as people have pointed out, you know, I mean, Wi-Fi Nobody loves Wi-Fi more than I do. I'm one of the people that actually invented it, okay, uh, and have Thank worked you. with it for 15 <laughs> years. Uh, but it's a local area network technology that's good for, you know, in rooms like this. And, and as Larry's experience at the Fiesta Bowl shows, you know, in larger scale networks, it has some disadvantages because you're basically working with 75 megahertz. And uh, you've got a lot of people to serve. So we, we have to get better at uh, repurposing spectrum, because all the spectrum's been assigned, right? There's not any, any virgin spectrum that's just sitting out there waiting for an initial assignment. It's all been assigned to something, or at least all the spectrum that's in the range that we have technology we can use today. So we have to get a whole lot better at repurposing spectrum, and this, this, the way the light squared controversy has developed, I think, illustrates how poor we are as a nation at repurposing spectrum. So, so why is nobody's hair on fire about this stuff? And I use the term advisedly. Um, but but when, you, when you look at what's, what's happening, I was out in, um, in Silicon Valley, uh, in San Francisco, and, and Chairman Jenikowski came out 
and he was speaking to uh, some venture capitalists. He was talking to folks who do um, Foursquare, um, a, a number of people doing mobile apps. And one of the VCs said that fully 50% of the investment in new companies in Silicon Valley is, um, mobile, um, is, is based in new mobile technologies. If we're going to accommodate them, shouldn't we be having a robust discussion in Congress and in Washington about Spectrum as we're having about other issues? And why aren't we having that discussion? And why isn't, you know, if, if, if innovation, creativity, global competitiveness, our um, national economy is going to turn on new mobile applications and new mobile um, uh, opportunities, should we be having a more uh, robust conversation? And when I say mobile, you have to understand that all of those mobile towers also feed into a wired environment as well. Where's the discussion here in Washington? Why are people upset about it? Well, I think there is discussion, and I think the problem is there continues to be discussion. <laughs> okay, why is there only discussion? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I mean, I think it goes to what Richard said is uh, there are existing users of, of virtually any spectrum that, that uh, is suitable for use with today's technology, and so how do you find a way to, to uh, address those users in a way that, that allows them to share the spectrum or to make the spectrum more available in TIA? And the government has been looking at that. The Hill has had spectrum legislation pending to help drive that for a while, and, and probably will move something this year. Um, is See, my, this my, year, my, but, my, my English but, teacher said use action verbs, things like pending and looking. I'm not sure the action verbs that she would have been referring to. I mean, I think I, that's a great point. I mean, people are, there's no doubt, you know, Sprint certainly believes spectrum is needed too, but. As an operator, we also have to find ways to keep the business going and respond to customers' needs today. And that's why Sprint and other operators are looking at other technologies. And as I said before, you're never going to get enough spectrum to ever be able to add enough spectrum to meet all of the demand simply through spectrum. You're not going to have 25 times more spectrum in five years. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it isn't possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there isn't 25 times more spectrum available. So how do you meet as much as you can meet with with these buckets of additional spectrum that come along every few years. If you look historically, you know, the cellular industry started with cellular, 50 megahertz of spectrum, and then less when it first started. It moved to PCS and added PCS. It moved to uh, the AWS band. It moved to the 700 megahertz band. It moved to 800 megahertz um, uh, conversion. It moved to 2.5 gigahertz. These come in chunks, typically. And they don't come every year, they come every few years. But I think we're definitely at a point where we need to be moving towards identifying and, and coming up with new spectrums. So that it can be made available, that you can find ways to share, find ways to have the users make uh, whole and, and, and have uh, their business continue. But the spectrum need is definitely going to be there. It might is there today. Uh, well, it would be an understatement to say that uh, the policy is not moving at the speed of technology. And, and a big part of the problem is it's not that there isn't any um, discussion uh, or things on the table, but it, it's like this problem of not being able to walk and, and shoot down, you know, and, 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 and walk and go far ahead. Because right now, uh, you know, because the um, probably because the national broadband plans take out this whole so many hundred more megahertz, all of the well, all, you know, the spectrum legislation that's pending has become, you know, narrowly focused on, on auctions, on getting broadcast spectrum for auction. And so that's taken all the air out of the room when we need a much, you know, broader and, and, and further looking approach. Uh, you know, we've all mentioned about the need to repurpose. Uh, it's all been assigned, right? There's, there's not that much left on the shelf after broadcast, after broadcasting and a few federal bands to offer. And yet we're not putting in place the uh, policies we need to share the grossly underutilized spectrum, whether that's more unlicensed spectrum, that's, you know, you get so much, you squeeze so much more out of it because it's small, you use it in small areas, you reuse the same frequencies over and over, or sharing the federal bands that are likely used. There, there was legislation like the uh, um, uh, Snow and Carry Bill that had all that in it, but it's like, it was like, they couldn't, it wasn't, couldn't be ambitious and get to that. And so what we're was just, the snow carry like a decade ago? I mean, how long ago was that? I mean, I, I was <laughs> no, last year. Last year. Okay. Last year. Right. And, and, you know, <laughs> there was a snow carry that I remember, so this is snow carry reduction. Well, that's true. I mean, yeah, yeah the, the latest version. Okay. But, but it anticipated, um, you know, these needs, but, but now we're down to just, we're still arguing over, you know, are we going to uh, do incentive auctions just for the broadcast band and just for auctions? 
and even outlaw in the House bill uh, unlicensed spectrum. So it's, uh, you know, we really need to, to, you know, just be able to move faster forward with a broader, broader look. Jeff, yeah, do you look like you're... Well, I mean, I, I think somebody has to come to the defense of the Congress a little here because they take it on the chin on so many things. Um, and, and, and I think that we should recognize that this is an issue that has bipartisan, you know, some of these issues have significant bipartisan support. There has been focus on this. There's been some legislation moving. Um, a lot of the fighting has been over some of the finer points, but but fundamentally, you have you have agreement uh, in, in both houses and both parties that we should move forward with incentive options to repurpose television spectrum uh, and, and and make it available for for wireless broadband. Um, that alone will not solve the whole problem. Um, but if we can get 80 or 100 megahertz of new spectrum out of this, you know. What, not to mention a few dollars for the treasury. What a wonderful thing uh, to end up with here. So we shouldn't, we should not look that gift, gift horse in the mouth. On a lot of the other issues, um, I, I, I agree with Michael. I think we should be looking more about how we can do more shared spectrum with federal users. Um, undoubtedly, uh, there can be more authorizations for unlicensed use in bands like in five gigahertz, where there's where there's great ability to, to share that and, and expand the Wi-Fi footprint, which is going to be necessary, as well as expanding the license footprint. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, things can always be better, but I think if we can get some incentive auction legislation done this year, as looks likely to occur, we're going to make at least a down payment on some of what needs to be done here. Uh, more will need to be done. More action will need to be taken. Um, I do sometimes worry that some proponents of some of the smaller ideas that have come out here are more interested in making sure that every potentially interesting or good idea ends up in the legislation, which makes it more difficult to pass the legislation. Right now, getting the legislation through is probably more important than anything. So let's go back to the National Broadband Plan before, and before we get out of Washington, get broader. Um, I used to run NTI, as, as um, Tim noted, and we were able to give more than 200 megahertz, and it was, it was painful. Um, getting the agencies to step up and, and give, you know, they always, you know, they, everything was hit under, under a, a peach basket and digging it up was, was, was a full-time job for me and about 100 people who worked with me. Um, we are trying to get more spectrum out of the federal government users. Where does that stand? How are we doing there with regard to NTIs work with um, our various federal agencies and their willingness to uh, share, um, relocate, move, or otherwise make more spectrum available? Michael, I guess I would go to you and then Richard if you want to respond. Well. Yeah, it, it's extremely difficult because the, the federal users, uh, you know, particularly the military, is saying, you know, we need more spectrum, not less, uh, for what we want to do in the future, drones and, you know, it's increasingly a, a technological warfare uh, more than boots on the ground in terms of where we're, we're headed. At the same time, so much of these uses are, are you know, are, are not in all places at all at all times. In fact, it's, if you measure it, it's, you know, it, the use is sporadic. It's just when they need it, they really, really need it. So NTA is having an incredibly difficult time figuring out how they can clear some of these federal bands completely, even a small amount like the 1755, the 1780 band that's globally harmonized for LTE that the industry really, really wants the most. They're having a really difficult time figuring out how do we get these guys completely off so we could auction it on an exclusive basis. Meanwhile, the NTIA report recently identified, you know, as I think I, I mentioned, something like 900 other megahertz uh, above that uh, that is occupied by things like radar. Radar is the biggest user, right? Over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of megahertz uh, that could be shared, um, but it, it's going to take, you know, new kind of new business models or using it, you know, low power, things like low power indoors for, uh, for offload. Uh, but it can relieve a lot of the uh, uh, the drain on on these other networks. Richard? Yeah, one of the the issues with mobile spectrum is that there really is a there's a strong incentive to harmonize allocations internationally. And the uh, 3GPP and ITU come up with these band plans so that they try to make say 1800 megahertz is a, a mobile frequency worldwide. And this really helps people that build handsets uh, because you know you don't have to build one version for every country. And when we look at where the U.S. stands in terms of these international allocations of spectrum for, for mobile uses, we're way behind the rest of the world because we've over-allocated to government uses. And 
principally that means defense and exactly why the Defense Department, which is not supposed, I mean the Army's not supposed to be working against the American people, why they need that allocation within our borders is sort of mysterious, but it leads to things like drones that get brought down um, over Afghanistan because somebody figured out they can just jam the radio frequencies that guide them and, and you know, they can't go complain to the FCC about it, you know, in Afghanistan. It I mean, I, you know, I, I will spend a little bit of time defending the, um, the Defense Department, again, from using my, my NTI hat. One of the things is you fight as you train. And they want to use the same um, bandwidth here when they're training that they're going to use overseas when they're fighting. But I also will say that I, I had a lot of interesting conversations with generals and assistant secretaries and secretaries of the Army and Navy about Spectrum that they couldn't tell me. If they did tell me, I have to give them my puppy or something. I mean, it's like, you know, the hostage. So it was, um, you, you never quite get to all the Spectrum they have or why they need all the Spectrum they have. But there are some real good reasons why some of the bandwidth have to be used in the United States as well as, as internationally. Let me uh, move out of that to um, a couple of folks uh, made mention of wireless as a substitute for wireline in some communities um, using it more often than others. Uh, Susan Crawford wrote an op-ed front page of the, of the Washington, of the New York Times, and talking about, uh, talking about um, uh, wireline versus wireless and minorities, low-income people were increasingly using wireless as a substitute um, for wireline. Um, I was telling some of you out in the hall, I've had this conversation for more than the past decade. Um, I happen to be black, for those of you who haven't noticed, and I, um, despite my 1% usage of technology, I come from the projects in Brooklyn, so I used to be poor. Um, and I'm trying hard not to go back there. I'll stay black, but don't really necessarily want to go poor. Um, <laughs> but when I go back to my community and I talk to folks in this community, for a lot of folks, um, they enjoy the wireless experience, and they really don't want to use a laptop. They prefer using smartphones. They prefer using um, tablets. And we think it's a, you know, in some communities that it may not be substitutable, but it's what we want to do. Um, is that somehow problematic? Is that something we should be encouraging? Will tablets become a substitutable commodity for um, uh, wireline, wired laptops and wired PCs? Is it going to be an evolving mix? And should we be worried that some communities are going to be left behind because of a quote unquote overdependence on um, wireless technologies? So this is something that I looked into when Susan did her most recent op-ed, and this is basically themes that she's been uh, developing for quite some time. And I went and looked at uh, Pew Center for American Life has done, you know, they do these annual studies about how people are using the internet. And they, they explored this question about communities of color and what kinds of applications they, they run on their mobile handsets. And it turns out, that actually black people are much more proficient at running mobile apps in the United States than white people are. That the average number of like different applications that black people run on their on their handsets is it's a larger number, they spend more time at it. And basic I mean you could make the argument that actually white people are falling behind and we're losing the We have a digital divide? Yeah we got a digital <laughs> divide. Or because, you know white people are sitting at home on their on their couches watching Netflix. Well, black people are sort of are, are already into the next generation of, of networking technology, which is things like virtual reality, augmented reality, and it's not just traditional, you know, Hollywood feeding you the, the same, you know, watching reruns of Lost. I mean, they're you know, these are entirely different applications. They interact with the way people socialize and how they shop, and it's not so much probably education and job, you know, applications or yeah, that, that is hard to do on a on a mobile handset, but it's a there's a new generation of technologies that is emerging, you know, not only among communities of color in the United States, but around the world. Remember that there are there are probably a billion people that are there. There are three billion people that use mobile devices that have never been connected any other way to any other network. And the impact that that connectivity has on these people's lives around the world is extremely profound. Anybody else? I mean, I mean, what I would add too is I think what you're seeing today that maybe you didn't see five years ago is is a vibrant market on application development for mobile. So you have you know Apple with hundreds of thousands of applications one, and Android one million on uh, iOS. It, that's right. So uh, those applications are becoming I think more and more uh, compelling to people, um, more and more attractive to people. Um, you can pull out your phone today and, and uh, you can go to almost any website and you, you surf to the website, but immediately they offer you a custom tailored application to reach that website and do more things easier on the mobile device. And I think that's just also 
for those who experiment and those who learn, those are they're making the mobile device more and more compelling as, an, as a tool of your life. And, and so I think you are finding people who, who no longer pull out the laptop or no longer go to a fixed PC in the basement or wherever to do what they're doing. They rely on the device because it's handy. And, and if they don't have that fixed PC, well, then they're not missing it. I'm going to turn the microphone. <laughs> um, I, I, it's, it's funny. In 2000, I left the government, 99 into 2000. I flew, and I'd always walk past the people in first class, and I noticed that everybody there had a laptop. And I'm like, well, this is a sea change because everybody before then you know, had desktops. This is some of you who were, were still in high school in 2000 may not remember this. Um, but, but literally in 2000, you could almost see the sea change. If you go on a plane today and you walk past the folks in first class, everybody has a, has a tablet. I mean, it's, they're all, you know, newspapers are, you don't have to worry, the uh, flight attendants don't come, uh, come along anymore with the newspaper bags, the newspaper, because everybody's sitting there with their tablet um, or, you know, their Kindle Fire or their iPhone or their Android, whatever. We've, we're seeing another generational shift. And it's starting with one group, and it may be you know young African Americans, Latinos, and you know more affluent whites um, sitting up in first class. But eventually, that coalesces across society. And I'm sorry, Michael, I didn't mean to cut you off. And I'll turn it to you. No, 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 that's fine. But you know, there's a, so that's great. You know, early early adopters and apps are cool and and all that. And and, and but there is a, a downside that I alluded to. You know, in the my opening remarks, and that is if you don't have. Uh, both subscriptions, you know, if you don't have the, you know, the, uh, the the home PC with a fast broadband connection as well, you know, increasingly down the road, you're, prob you're probably going to be missing many of those um, uh, of, the, of the sort of national purposes that were outlined in the national broadband plan. In other words, the use of of high capacity broadband for education, for health care, for job search, for um, all kinds of other things so could, besides, so could, could you, besides entertainment. And, and on the hand device, even if, you, even if the tablet screen, okay, certainly not screen's not big enough on a smartphone. So even on a tablet, though, um, if, if you're paying $10 for every extra gigabyte of connectivity, right, above the, t so, so a typical right now is two gigabytes. You buy a two gigabyte bucket for $25, and it's $10 for each additional gigabyte compared to 250 gigabyte cap on a, on a, on a wired uh, plan. So you're not going to be doing a lot of that, you know, those sort of good national purpose activities on a small screen at ten dollars per gigabyte. So that's that, that's the problem. So yeah, and, and this is part of the challenge, I think, of this sort of tablet world. Because you know, I even think of just myself. I don't think I've used a device that is plugged into the internet in a long time. It goes from the office to home, and, and in between, and it moves from from a uh, fixed Wi-Fi to a mobile network to a fixed Wi-Fi. The problem is when you start talking about getting a large number of consumers who no longer have the Wi-Fi at home, because right now most tablet users are still moving most of their traffic across Wi-Fi. And that may change over time. And if you really get to the point where they're doing full wireless substitution, you're, gonna, you're going to be putting even more uh, pressure on the, the wireless network itself, the pure mobile network. Now, in many situations, uh, it's not a problem. In rural areas, there's plenty of capacity. Uh, at nighttime, you know, um, the, the networks can handle this. But at points of congestion, you're going to start having real problems. Uh, both, there's the technological problem, and Michael's also identifying the cost problem. And the cost problem, we can argue about. I won't pretend to know uh, the economics of the carriers and, and what is reality and what isn't reality. But, but I would suspect that if that really became an enormous trend, we could neither have carrier, it would, not, it would be bad for the carriers that are charging 10 bucks for the extra gigabytes because the customers wouldn't like them. And it would also be bad for the carriers that are not charging for it because they won't be able to pay for the expense of expanding their network to be able to handle all that data. And so it, this is really a big challenge. It's part of why looking at good ways to do offload is really important. And we're going to have to really think about, you know, what's, what's the right answer societally for this? You know, the carriers may find it to be actually in their interest to start running some of their own Wi-Fi just to offload their own traffic because people aren't doing it for them. I mean, uh, in one instance, I'm, in, I'm a New Yorker, um, and I was in New York about three weeks ago and go through Ryan Park. And everybody's sitting there. There's a Wi-Fi. I think it, I think it was AT&T that provided, but I think other providers would, you know, are doing similar things. So if you're in New York and you don't, you know, and you, you don't want to get over your two gig cap, go to down to Bryant Park, hang out with the brothers, and you know, and 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 serve to your little heart's content, uh, which is something I actually did. So there are there are things that are happening that are creative 
to, to help ameliorate the situation. You know, it's interesting that um, when I'm in Washington, there's a word that doesn't come up as often as when I'm in the Valley or up in New York, and that's the cloud. Um, and when you look at, whether it's iCloud, or you look at what a lot of folks, you know, um, people solve so business model, uh, I'm sorry, um, not people solve, um, uh, Salesforce. Salesforce's whole business model, um, we're increasingly moving to where this can be dumber so that, because everything, all the intelligence is in the network, what kind of impact is that going to have? And are, we, are you factoring those cloud-like applications into your forecast? And, and what are the, the businesses doing? And, and folks like ITI, when they're thinking about this, in terms of the implications of the cloud for uh, mobile devices and for the, um, um, uh, the wire line, because we're going to be pulling more information down. I, I have literally, I have 14,000 songs um, on my laptop that I just put up in a cloud locker so that anywhere I'm in the world, I can pull down my music. Almost all of them I've downloaded legally, by the way. Um, but, but I can pull them down so in case anybody from SOAP is here. Um, but, but you can, um, but well, what's that going to do in terms of, of, of the network? Well, it is in the forecast, but um, the carriers start going to have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know to what extent, um, you know, we do detail modeling um, to forecast where things are going. We actually do it at, at a cell level as well to kind of forecast based upon the environment of the cell, the normal expected traffic of the cell, and how that grows. Um, I do think, and I'll give you a gut reaction, this is not necessarily a sprint reaction, but a gut reaction from working in the industry for 35 years, is, is that um, there is push and pull on costs, you know, there's push and pull on speed, data speeds, uh, that may end up keeping smartphones smart for a while. Um, folks still want to be able to do certain things even if they're in the middle of Montana and there's no wireless activity, no wireless availability, or if they have a very slow link, they still want to be able to do things. And I think until, until the networks are capable of handling that kind of cloud traffic, I think there will be some suppression on how much of that is adopted on a mobile basis. But that's, in, that's not a sprint answer, that's my gut reaction, is, is this is a very complicated moving machine. Uh, a lot of pieces fit together into, into how someone uses their phone, what they're willing to pay for the phone, how a network's designed, what's built into the phone, and, and uh, it's easy to make forecasts. It's hard to really be accurate in knowing how something game-changing like cloud computing is going to play out. That's yeah. I mean, I guess I'd, I'd question whether cloud computing is really all that game changing because to me, a, a cloud is, it, we used to call that a mainframe. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, what's so revolutionary about the cloud? Um, but mainframe. six billion people potentially having access to that mainframe? Yeah, I mean, but what it is, what the, what the cloud does for you mm -hmm. is it's CPU power and it's storage that doesn't fit in your handset. It doesn't necessarily translate into a whole lot of data traffic is the, you know, the smarts on your smartphone, I mean, one of the things that they'll do is sort of crunch down the, 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 the information that goes to the cloud, and then they're gonna get information from the cloud that's in a very compressed form, and then they'll decompress it. And so it, it doesn't necessarily, you know, create a whole lot of network load, but it, it, it extends your battery life. I mean, I think that's probably the, the actual main benefit that it has for mobile users, is those, those CPU cycles that are in the cloud are, you know, the, the wire, the electricity is from the wall, so that's what okay. uh, Let us turn to the audience for questions. We promise you'd have a chance for a discussion, and we want to make this uh, a real discussion. Any questions? Abs we've, we've answered all of your questions up here. All right, so that being the case, let me... Let me <laughs> we have a question okay. right here. Okay. Um, how, did, how did your predictions about wireless and wireline dovetail with what Mr. Robin said earlier about where the wire Plus the wireline industries were going. Does it do his predictions? I know I'm asking you to talk about his predictions, but do his predictions include this idea of offloading the wireless traffic onto the wireline network? And if so, why is wireline doing so poorly if wireless is growing so fast? I I, I think um, so. I won't speak for for him um, because I because I don't know uh, what what his numbers are based on. Uh, I think it's also important to recognize that that our projections are for internet traffic, mobile and fixed. Um, we do not project other types of transmission of things like the video that is being transmitted by a cable system or a, or a fiber system 
uh, to individuals or, or phone calls or things like that. So, so we have isolated, now it's the bulk of the data that moves, but we've isolated one particular type of data in that. And I think when you look at part of the interplay between how these networks work is operated, when you have, when you, have uh, you know, one-way linear video delivery in addition to data, uh, there's a lot of interplay between those two things in the fixed side of the world. Um, and how those price out and compete with each other, I think, is what he's focusing on more. On the, on the mobile side, it, there is a big push-pull on offload versus not offload. And some of, some of how we describe offload um, limits what we count as offload because we consider, like, when my laptop is on Wi-Fi at home, I don't consider that offload. Now, some people could argue it's offload because it's going wirelessly. But there was no way that I was going to run that across the cell network um, otherwise. Uh, but maybe when I you know, uh, take it or a tablet into Starbucks, that's offload, or, or I'm in, in some public place on that front. So I think it depends how you slice and dice these things. The reality is, is that data traffic is growing enormously on all networks. Um, and while, while Richard's point about average speed declining because there's more mobile connections, the average speed of mobile connections is increasing, and the average data usage is just exploding across all of them. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a high capital intensive industry, and people have to invest a lot uh, to, to make it work. And it's also a very competitive industry. And when you add those two things together, uh, some people do better than others at different points in time. And I, and I you know, I didn't get to see Craig's um, presentation. I had another meeting, but I. Um, I did look at the beginning, and when you look at the, the precipitous decline in, in voice, I mean, that's for anybody, that's a significant amount of revenue and a, and, a, and a change that I think people saw coming, but I'm not sure anybody saw it falling off the cliff quite as quickly as it has. Um, you know, I remember when you used to go to your house and the first thing you do is connect your phone. I don't know anybody under 35 who's thought about connecting a phone um, to their home. They carry the phone with them. And that's, you know, I have a phone at home but that serves two purposes. So my mother can occasionally call me, which she can she give it to my wireline, and so that uh, political um, uh, campaigns can call me and ask me to donate. That's it. That's it. <laughs> if the phone rings after 6.30, somebody's asking for a campaign contribution, that's it. Nobody else ever uses that phone. And I, why I haven't pulled it out of the wall yet, I don't know. I think I'll go home tonight and do exactly that, which means those numbers will go down even further. Um, other questions? Hi, Steve Delby, I'm with that choice. Question for, for Jeff, I don't want to have to wait till May to see the great findings in Cisco's uh, VNI, the index report. Is there any uh, highlights you can give us of what you've discovered behind the scenes, particularly on the mobile bandwidth use? Because you only shared some highlights initially. We'd like to learn more about what Cisco really knows about the nature of traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't have any of this year's secrets uh, uh, available yet. They're, they're, they're still being baked. But I think, you know, the, 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 the one thing I will point out that I think is, is interesting that um, uh, is a little bit of bragging on the company's part, which is why I didn't uh, do it, but our, our uh, people who do this like to do this, which is they go back and they look at the old data of our old projections because we've not been doing this long enough that we have real data. We've actually under-projected everything. Um, in the past, but not by any, by less than ten percent, but but all of our past projections have turned out to actually be too low, and so uh, if you look at some, you know, there's some others who do projections that are a little lower than ours. We worry that we're actually under projecting going forward for the future on on that front. And I, and I share that concern. I mean, everything I see, and again. Though you don't get out to the valley much, you don't get up to New York, up to Silicon Alley much. Go up there and talk to some, you know, some of these kids and what they're doing. And you know, um, Julius likes to talk about an apps economy. Um, it's real. Um, there are really smart people doing some really amazing things that are going to come your way. And even if you look at what's happening on your television, I mean, your, your, ta your television's now app, and, app enabled, and that's going to be on the wireline network very soon. I mean, over the top is real. It's going to change some of the dynamics, and it gets pretty exciting if you, you know, if you're a geek like me. Go ahead, Mike. You know, though. Uh, on that point, though, you know, I also worry a, a little bit. I mentioned this, and mm -hmm. it may be something uh, would be a good would be a good question from the audience. <laughs> but as I mentioned before, I, one thing I'm concerned about less competition uh, on the wireline side. I think what Craig was talking these natural monopoly tendencies asserting themselves, and we see that. You know, that's why we're, for example, asking for more information on the Verizon uh, Spectrum Co. deal. This is this. Uh, Verizon acquiring Spectrum from the cable consortium of cable big cable companies that bought it together, and now with some kind of joint marketing agreement that we, nobody knows what's in there yet, and it seems to be a harbinger of dividing 
the industry saying, you know, having a peace treaty saying we're going to divide wireline, wireless, monopoly, duopoly. And, uh, and that's very concerning because of over-the-top video. You know, even a 250 gigabyte cap, right? If you, if you, if you think of over-the-top, as many young people do, as potentially competing with uh, broadcast television, right, with, with subscription TV, well, that's nothing then because HD is six to eight gigabytes per hour, right? Which means that, so if you multiply that out, you're talking about to really compete with that, to provide enough capacity, you're going to be using anywhere from, you know, 500 to 900 gigabytes per month of consumption, uh, which is way over that cap. So there's just this inherent collision coming, uh, I think, between over the top and these, um, these uh, uh, data caps and usage-based pricing, which is an incentive not just to sort of make money to stay in business, but to protect the old business. I mean, and it, 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 this, these are debates that I think we're going to have, and you're just shaking your head. What's the matter? Oh, my I stream Netflix all the time, and much of that is HD content, and my data consumption rates never approach anywhere near my 250 gigabyte max because a lot of that video is compressed. Yeah, yeah. And if it's straight uncompressed HD, then yes, maybe eight gigabytes per file. However, most of the HD that we consume through our TVs, through our laptops, and through our mobile devices is compressed video that gets decompressed when we watch it. So I mean, in ten hopes. Good. Is our uh, yeah. I mean, we we've, we've done. A, I did the math on that when the AT and T came out with their with their data caps, and I looked at Netflix and. If you have the, the U-verse thing with, with AT&T, you had a higher data cap, and, and what it actually amounts to in terms of real Netflix viewing is that you had enough to basically do about 18 hours a day, you know, every day of the month. So, I mean, it's just really not an issue. For people that have ADSL, um, yeah, you only have about 40 hours a week uh, that you can spend, you know, watching Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Well, even I don't think I do 40 hours a week, so I'm feeling pretty good. This is just like Netflix. Netflix. Any, any other uh, questions from the audience? Because if not, I'm going to ask folks to, um, since we are, we are a little bit over, I'm going to ask folks to give their summary remarks. Uh, and I'm going to to take about 90 seconds, as, and I'm going to clock you again. Um, you know, if, if you were somebody in the audience or, or watching this um, uh, online or going to read a tweet, what would you want to know about the next two to five years that you should be thinking about in terms of Washington public policy and, and the collision? Uh, we talked earlier that I, you know I, I think the present collision is like um, two Ford Fusions um, hitting each other. I think five years from now it could be like two pay, propane trucks hitting each other. And you had an analogy that was even better, I think. Yeah, I thought it might be like an Italian cruise ship. Running the ground. the ground. So you know, where are we? What are we looking at? And, and how do we avoid um, being the captain of that cruise ship? Yeah, well, and, and fortunately, most people got off that ship. But um, I, I think we have to focus on, do, on doing the things that government can do best, which is providing spectrum in the most effective and efficient ways. We can have incentive auctions to repurpose, repurpose TV spectrum for wireless broadband. We can uh, look at more efficient use of federal spectrum to make more of that available for both shared and exclusive use. We can look at some bands that are currently heavily underutilized, like five gigahertz, that can be made available for more unlicensed usage, uh, including Wi-Fi usage going forward. If we do all of these things, we will be you know, keeping up with the tiger that is running after us. Um, we, we probably need to move a lot of federal spectrum if we're going to run faster than the tiger is, though. And so uh, these are all good things to start with. So let's get the first ones on the list done and keep moving forward. I hadn't thought about conclusions. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm enjoying the discussion, but uh, no, I agree. I agree with Jeff. I think the government needs to move, move forward on identifying ways to uh, bring more spectrum to the marketplace, uh, address the national broadband plan goals in a more proactive way, um, and I think uh, ensure that at the same time um, that that. Um, we continue to maintain a competitive environment for for uh, the mobile industry and for internet access. Competition, more than anything, probably drives the prices that consumers pay. And without adequate competition, I think we, we do have the risk to, of, of those prices creeping up to a point where it stifles innovation, stifles 
uh, consumers' ability to, to, to embrace these things that we all think are, are worthwhile. So I will, uh, I guess, merge, merge what I've heard from these two gentlemen and say that, the, yeah, the, the most important thing if we're, you know, three to five years and beyond is going to be to what, in terms of what the government can do is to pay uh, a lot of attention, serious attention to competition policy uh, because without competition we're going to get, you know, pulled in the wrong directions on these things. And then to make uh, spectrum capacity more abundant. And if we rely uh, only on auctions, you know, clearing, auctioning for exclusive use licenses, uh, that's going to buy us a few years. But, you know, given Cisco's projections, then we're going to hit the wall or, or run aground uh, in the cruise ship analogy. Um, so, so we have to not only while we're doing that, we also have to um, provide more direct access uh, to spectrum, more, more unlicensed, more uh, sharing of the federal bands on this sort of uh, small cell spectrum reuse basis, because that's that's going to really uh, uh, amplify the, uh, the the bandwidth that's available, so that we're not inhibiting innovation uh, and uh, consumer take up of these new bandwidth intensive applications that are just on the road. Yeah, I'm really excited about the opportunities for mobile apps that, that are going to come about when we fully start to exploit the video cameras and the, and the location sensing capabilities that mobile handsets have. And instead of video coming down from Hollywood, a whole lot of it is actually going to be pushed up to the cloud from the mobile device, and the mobile devices will be like built into your eyeglasses and, and will actually track where you are. The video cameras that are built into cars are going to feed information up into the cloud. In fact, one of the most exciting platforms for mobile innovation is the, is the car. Uh, Ford and BMW are, are leading the, the pack in terms of their ability to, to use to take user devices and sync up with the you know with the operation of the car because that they understand the, the cycle time is so much faster than than the rate at which people replace cars. So what Washington can do to help is uh, I think they need to start thinking about a comprehensive spectrum policy that allows for the more efficient and faster repurposing of spectrum and we got to figure out the roles that licensed, unlicensed, and there may actually be a third way to manage spectrum that, that's sort of a hybrid of licensed and unlicensed where there's a, it's, it's limited to a small number of licensees that perform management functions. So, there, that would be the, the number one priority, I think, for Washington is to, is to focus on creating a comprehensive national spectrum plan. So, so let me take the prerogative of the chair and, and just maybe echo and, and maybe have a slight divergence. Um, somebody said, and I think they're right, that policy can never keep up with technology. There's just no way Washington can ever win that race. And, you know, I've spent 30 years of my career um, involved in policy and involved in technology policy. It's not going to happen. It's particularly not going to happen with regard to what we're seeing here. But what Washington can do and should do and has done re reasonably well most of the time is create an environment so that these new technologies can come to market and to create an environment for investment. The reality is it costs billions of dollars to build these networks and we need to make sure that we give people incentive to build those networks. And we also want to make sure that we give consumers, um, that we have a, a guide pass so consumers will still be able to afford these technologies and, and, uh, and can pay the subscription rates for these technologies. So that, and there's a balance that I think Washington can, can help steer. Um, I'm, unlike Mr. Moffitt, pretty excited about the future. Um, I, I actually think, I'm sure Craig, Craig's a great guy, I love him, but um, it was kind of a downer um, reading his slides. Um, <laughs> and um, um, I don't want to leave you, I don't want to leave any of you on, on, on a down note. If you went to CES last week, if you go up to Silicon Alley, if you go out to Silicon Valley, if you talk to a 15 year old who, who's a gamer and you watch what's happening in real time, there's a lot of headroom. Um, but I do think that headroom is only going to happen if we do, as many folks say, have a national spectrum policy. And I'll be honest, my ability to go to the Defense Department and other users, it wasn't just defense, and get spectrum out of it was because I had Al Gore and Bill Clinton behind me saying, dude, you're going to give this up. And I really do think we need more. It can't just be Larry Strickling and, and Julius Janikowski. It's going to be at the higher levels that if we want to be a competitor in this space globally going forward, we're going to need spectrum. And folks who are holding back some of that spectrum are, are folks that report to the president and the vice president. Um, and Congress uh, funds them. Unless we have everybody engaged, I don't think we can win this particular um, battle in the time frame in which we're going to need to win it. Um, I thank all of you for your time this afternoon. I want to please join me in thanking the other panel.
Well, um, just quickly before you all run, um, I just want to punctuate the point. Um, thank you to, uh, I'm really pleased that over the course of two days, about a dozen panels, about 50 or 60 speakers for State of the Net. This is the last panel. I'm really thrilled that people I admire greatly, like Larry, our panel, Mr. Moffitt, who would come and speak for this. I'm, I'm really, really honored. So um, this concludes the State of the Net. Thank you, everybody, everybody and we'll see you next year.